In our next session, we're going to hear from the MUMPS work group, and Dr. Moore will introduce this session. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Um, I will give you a short update today from the MUMPS work group. To remind you of our terms of reference, the objective of the MUMPS work group was to establish, evaluate and propose policy options to prevent or control mumps outbreaks in the United States. We had a number of activities associated with that, including look at the, looking at the epidemiology of mumps in the two-dose vaccine era. We looked at the available evidence on the duration of immunity following two doses of MMR and looked at other risk factors for vaccine failure. We've looked at the available impact available evidence on the impact of a third dose of MMR vaccine for mumps outbreak control. And finally, we've also looked at programmatic implications and cost of various policy options for a third dose of MMR vaccine to prevent or control mumps outbreaks. Here are the work group members. Uh, we appreciate everything that everyone has contributed, especially our CDC work group lead, Mona Marin, and her uh, associates, Mariel Marlowe and Manisha Patel, particularly have been very, very helpful. So our activities and, and outputs have been divided into two major uh, sections. The first, between March and October of last year, we did our evidence assessment with a number of calls and surveys, and that outcome wrapped up in October of last year when the ACIP voted to recommend the use of a third dose of mumps virus containing vaccine for persons in the groups identified at risk, at increased risk for mumps during an outbreak. Then since that vote, in, between January and June of this year, the work group has been focused on providing technical consultation and discussion with CDC in order to create the CDC guidance for the use of a third dose of MMR vaccine during mumps outbreaks. And today you'll see an overview of the proposed CDC guidance for the use of a third dose of MMR vaccine during outbreaks. So the next steps for this group, at this point, the MUMPS ACIP workgroup has accomplished its terms of reference with the evidence available to us to date. And so we're announcing a temporary hiatus of workgroup activities, although CDC is going to continue to monitor MUMPS epidemiology in the U.S. and also look for new scientific evidence that can inform us about better control of MUMPS going forward. And in fact, we have a workgroup call scheduled next week for those of you on the call. So at this point, I will turn this over to you for the... Next presentation, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore, <clears throat> and good afternoon. As presented during ACIP meetings last year, a substantial increase in the number of mumps cases has occurred in the United States since late 2015. This graph shows the number of reported mumps cases by month from 2012 to 2017, with incidents per year shown below the graph. The number of cases in 2016 and in 2017 were nearly double the total number of cases from 2012 through 2015. Incidents was 19.8 per million in 2016 and 18.9 per million in 2017 which is the first time since the 1980s that the incidence has stayed higher than 10 per million for two consecutive years. Also since 2013, at least 70% of cases with known vaccination status had received two or more doses of MMR. In addition to the increase in the number of cases reported, there was also an increase in the number of outbreaks from one in 2012 to 88 in 2017. And beginning in 2013, over half of all reported cases were outbreak associated. In response to this increased burden, last October, ACIP recommended that persons previously vaccinated with two doses of a mumps virus containing vaccine, who are identified by public health authorities as being part of a group or population at increased risk for acquiring mumps because of an outbreak, should receive a third dose of mumps virus containing vaccine to improve protection against mumps disease and related complications. A key part of this recommendation is that public health authorities determine which groups or populations are at increased risk. 
To assist public health authorities with implementing the ACIP recommendation, CDC developed guidance in collaboration with the MUMPS ACIP workgroup and in consultation with other partner organizations, including Council, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, and the American College Health Association. Additional feedback was received during several partner meetings and national conferences, as shown on the timeline here, and included in the guidance presented today. The proposed guidance includes three sections. First, identifying groups of persons at risk for acquiring mumps during an outbreak. Second, assessing transmission in the setting to determine if these groups are at increased risk and, and thus should receive a third dose of MMR vaccine and third, implementing a third dose recommendation. The first part of the guidance, identifying groups or, of persons at risk for requiring mumps, starts by defining persons at risk and close contact. Persons at risk for mumps during an outbreak are those who may be exposed to mumps virus through close contact with a mumps patient. Close contact is defined as either direct contact with infectious respiratory secretions or droplets, which generally travel three feet or less when an infected person talks, coughs, or sneezes, or close proximity for a prolonged period of time with a mumps patient during their infectious period, which is two days prior to five days after peritonitis onset or other salivary gland swelling. <coughs> Risk for acquiring mumps depends on likelihood of close contact exposure which can be classified as known exposure for a group of persons with reported close contact with a mumps patient, such as roommates or partners, likely exposure for a group of persons with either likely close contact with a mumps patient or close contact with persons with known exposure, or in other words, a group that is likely to be exposed to future cases. These are typically persons who share a social network with a mumps patient. And finally, potential exposure for a group of persons with any contact other than known or likely with mumps patients or persons with known exposure, such as persons sitting in the same lecture hall or cafeteria. To maximize the benefit of added protection of a third dose and get ahead of transmission during an outbreak, public health authorities should focus their investigation on groups of persons with known and likely exposure to determine if they are at increased risk. To determine if the known and likely exposure groups are at increased risk during an outbreak, the next step is to assess transmission in the setting. Public health authorities can assess transmission in the setting, defined here as the location, activity, or event where known or likely exposures are occurring, based on evidence of transmission in the setting, or in other words, there are close contact exposures within a setting resulting in transmission, and risk for transmission in the setting, or in other war, there is likelihood for continued transmission. They can then use these two, these two factors in a decision matrix shown here to determine if a group is at increased risk. In the next few slides, I will describe how each of these factors are stratified and used in the matrix, starting with evidence of transmission. Evidence of transmission can be stratified into three stages. No evidence of transmission, evidence that transmission occurred, and evidence of sustained or extensive transmission. Public health authorities can determine the stage by either the number of incubation periods since peritonitis onset in the first case, or by epidemiologic links among cases. In the guidance, we provide the criteria to make this assessment as shown here. In the interest of time, we will not review them in the presentation today. However, they are available in your handouts. The second factor in the decision matrix is risk for transmission in the setting. Risk for transmission in the setting results from close contact behaviors and interactions among, groups of, among persons in a group and increases with the intensity of close contact exposures, for example, physical contacts, contacts such as dancing or sharing of sports equipment or drinks, and the frequency of these exposures, for example, prolonged contact, such as sharing living spaces, or repeated contact, such as meeting regularly or sharing daily habits. Given the complexity of mumps outbreaks, risk for transmission can vary widely across settings and between outbreaks. Health departments will need to assess behaviors and interaction in each setting 
to determine if risk for transmission will be low, moderate, or high. To determine the level of risk, the written guidance provides examples for health department from previous community, university, school, and workplace outbreaks for health departments to compare against their own outbreak. Again, these are described in the guidance and will not be reviewed today. As mentioned in the beginning of this section, once public health authorities have assessed evidence of transmission and risk for transmission in the setting, they can enter them into the decision matrix to determine whether a group is at increased risk, may be at increased risk, or not at increased risk. Groups determined to be at increased risk should be recommended to receive a third dose. However, there may be additional epidemiologic factors to consider when deciding to make a third dose recommendation, including a third dose may be more likely to be indicated for a small defined versus a large dispersed group or population, or when there is an increasing versus decreasing case count or attack rate. Other considerations are if the group at increased risk includes persons who may potentially transmit to a susceptible population, for example, students who volunteer in child care centers, or if the setting is known to be high risk for transmission based on previously reported outbreaks, for example, fraternities, sports teams, or close-knit communities. The following section provides additional guidance for public health authorities when implementing a third dose recommendation. First, persons in the groups identified at increased risk should be advised to seek vaccine through routine immunization channels. However, public health authorities might choose to expand their response to include vaccination campaigns or clinics in certain situations, such as when case counts are increasing despite a recommendation already having been made, there is poor vaccine access or low vaccine uptake among the group at increased risk, or the group at increased risk includes hard to reach or vulnerable populations. Additional implementation guidance includes persons with unknown vaccination history, less than two doses, or other evidence of presumptive immunity should receive a dose if they are part of the group at increased risk. No additional dose should be given to persons who receive three or more doses before the outbreak or their second dose during the outbreak. Persons vaccinated with two MMR doses before the outbreak should receive a third dose regardless of time since their second dose. In studies and during recent outbreaks, cases have been reported in persons with intervals less than two and less than five years since receipt of the second dose. Public health authorities should follow ACIP general recommendations for the minimum interval for administration of live virus vaccines. Particularly during an expanded response, public health authorities may recommend, recommend a dose for all persons at increased risk without verification of vaccination history to avoid delays. Persons who receive a dose can be referred to their health care providers to assess the need for additional age-appropriate vaccination. This concludes the presentation on the proposed CDC guidance. Next, I will provide a brief update on CDC activities and mumps epidemiology in 2008. As Dr. Moore mentioned, CDC will continue to monitor mumps epidemiology and new scientific evidence. Additionally, CDC has several ongoing or planned priority activities to improve our understanding of outcomes related to use of a third dose. They include developing transmission models to examine factors that impact size and duration of an outbreak, measuring duration of antibody response five years after the third dose, evaluating antibody avidity or the quality of antibodies after the third dose compared with after the second dose of MMR, Assessing differences between antibody responses to vaccine versus circulating wild type mump strains, and monitoring mumps incidence among populations with third dose vaccine recipients to better characterize duration of protection after the third dose. And lastly, this slide shows the number of reported mumps cases by month from January 2012 through May 2018. So far in 2018, 1,415 cases and 30 outbreaks have been reported, which is about half as many cases and outbreaks than was reported during the same period in 2017. However, it is important to note that a large number of cases that occurred in late 2016 and early 2017 were linked to one outbreak in the Marshallese community in Arkansas that later seeded outbreaks in other states in 2017. Also, the lower number of cases in 2018 may reflect some delay in reporting.
CDC will continue to, continue to monitor mumps epidemiology and provide updates when available. I'd like to acknowledge the many colleagues and groups that have contributed or provided feedback for this guidance. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice presentation. Are there questions for Dr. Marlowe? Anybody? Oh, yes, Dr. Zahn. Yeah, I'm Mad Zahn with NATO. So thank, thank you for the update, and I congratulate the work. I mean, as a, from a local public health side, I think these changes or these proposals make a lot of sense. Um, I guess I'd ask, one thing I'd ask of CDC is, um, my sense of when third doses have been used on a national level generally have been like big outbreaks, like universities, you know, when that's been going on. Uh, you hear less about, but maybe just because it doesn't make the news as much about, you know, three cases in one gym class or, you know, or three or four cases in a football team. It, make, it makes sense, you know, to consider it in that situation. It sounds like this is, you know, kind of opening the door to potentially do that. Um, but I, I don't know, is that, is that all already being done on a routine basis or is that something that seems real, real different? Or new? Thanks, Dr. Zahn. Um, I can say from the, from the work group perspective and from personal experience, um, and we have implemented a third dose in smaller outbreaks in university in Tennessee. Um, and, and I think part of the reason it may not have been seen in smaller outbreaks until now was because there wasn't a lot of guidance available on the use of third dose and people were on their own to try to figure it out. And so I, I, we didn't necessarily hear about it, but I believe about half of the university outbreaks were fewer than 10 cases um, the, from, from when we surveyed the outbreaks around the country. But were they, were they then, we're going to just that you know, a distinct group or we, you know, was it, was it to the university or was it it's smaller? So we're just going for one door, you know, dorm right. or so such. So the smaller an outbreak is, the, the, the more targeted the third dose recommendation can be. And this guidance is intended to allow public health to be more focused and narrow in the application of a third dose at an earlier stage, potentially in a high risk transmission setting where the, where the risk and, and opportunity for it to become larger exist. You can get there at the beginning rather than waiting until it's very large. Yeah. and use a smaller response. Yeah, great, thank you. Dr. Hunter? I was just gonna to add to that, that the ability for the combination of the ACIP recommendation plus the lo local health department guidance allows the local health departments, rather than having to go out and give the vaccine themselves, they can pull the trigger faster and say, just go to your local provider to get it uh, through your insurance. At least that's the way I was thinking of it. And I don't know if you've implemented it that way. Uh, yes, I, I would say in, in my experience, we've recommended people go through routine channels. And sometimes if there's a student health opportunity, the student health center would make it available to the students who were directly impacted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to Zoster, uh, Dr. Valanja. Thank you, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, final session of the afternoon on herpes zoster vaccine update. Uh, this slide shows the composition of the 2018 Zoster workgroup, including the ACIP members and ex officio members, along with our liaison representatives and consultants, and our CDC liaisons. So following FDA licensure of uh, Shingrix in October of 2017, the ACIP made three recommendations. Uh, one, that uh, recombinant Zoster vaccine, or Shingrix, be recommended for prevention of zoster and complications for immunocompetent adults, 50 and above. Uh, second, that um, Shingrix be recommended for prevention of zoster and related complications for immunocompetent adults who were previously vaccinated with uh, zoster vaccine live or zostavax. And finally, that uh, um, RZV or Shingrix would be preferred over um, zoster vaccine live for the prevention of herpes zoster and related complications. 
And then these recommendations were subsequently published as a policy note in the MMWR in January of this year. So this is a summary of the uh, Zoster workgroup activities since the October meeting. Uh, we reviewed and approved the policy note that was published in January. There have been nine workgroup meetings that have been looking at the burden and pathophysiology of zoster in immunocompromised individuals, uh, looking at zoster vaccine performance in that population, as well as discussing plans for post-licensure monitoring of um, RZV in terms of both safety and, and effectiveness. Uh, today's presentation will uh, provide an update on these issues and uh, focus on um, plans for safety monitoring and coverage uh, for the uh, new vaccine. And then I think for me personally, this is the most important slide. Uh, this is my last meeting as chair uh, of this work group and um, Dr. Kelly Moore will be stepping in and taking over going forward. Uh, it's been a, just a great privilege for me to be part of this work group. I'm really proud of the accomplishments over the past four years dealing with some really complicated issues that, you know, frankly, I had no idea sort of what I was getting into when I agreed to be the chair. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of what the work group has accomplished in terms of providing support for the ACIP members uh, dealing with some really challenging topics. Uh, and I want to thank all the work group members and all the CDC support staff uh, for their commitment to that. And I especially want to thank our CDC li liaisons, uh, Kathleen Dooling and Rafael Harpaz, for uh, providing tremendous uh, support for this effort. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Dooling to provide an update. And we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Belanja, for leading us through these very complicated issues. It was really terrific. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the work group and CDC liaison and staff, I would like to echo that uh, thank you for your leadership. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Belanche just introduced me, my name is Dr. Kathleen Dooling, and I'm the CDC liaison for the Herpes Zoster Work Group. The presentation I'll give today uh, reflects the work of numerous groups at CDC who are responsible for various aspects of post-licensure monitoring of vaccines. The first topic I'll cover today uh, are the GSK post-marketing commitments for recombinant zoster vaccine, abbreviated hereafter as RZV. Next, I'll review the CDC post-marketing monitoring, which includes recombinant zoster vaccine safety, effectiveness, and zoster vaccine coverage. Uh, I will discuss recombinant zoster va vaccine supply and clinical guidance as well. There are three principal post-marketing commitments uh, for RZV study undertaken by GSK, as outlined in the October BLA approval letter from FDA. Uh, these, uh, the protocol submission and study completion are subject, those deadlines are subject uh, to change. First, GSK is committed to assess the safety, reactogenicity, and immunogenicity of recombinant zoster vaccine in adults with a prior episode of herpes zoster. In addition, there will be a targeted safety study to evaluate the safety of recombinant zoster vaccine in adults, as well as a study to assess the long-term efficacy, immunogenicity, and safety of recombinant zoster vaccine in adults 50 and older. So first we'll dis discuss the CDC safety monitoring of recombinant zoster vaccine. Uh, this is uh, a repetition from a slide that you saw earlier today in the influenza uh, session, but I think it bears repeating that the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS as it's commonly known, is the first pillar in safety monitoring. VAERS is a national early warning system to detect possible safety problems in U.S. licensed vaccines. Uh, VAERS is co-managed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration, and the system relies on passive reports of adverse events following immunization. Strengths of the system are that the data are national in scope, uh, that the system accepts reports from anyone, uh, and it is possible to rapidly detect safety signals and rare adverse events, and the data are available to the public. The system, of course, has limitations as well. Uh, there are reporting biases, uh, as well as inconsistent data quality and completeness. And because the system currently captures only, or because the system only captures adverse events following vaccination, there is a lack of an unvaccinated comparison group, and therefore, VAERS generally cannot assess causality. 
And in keeping that in mind, it's important to highlight that VAERS is really a hypothesis generating system. It identifies potential vaccine safety concerns uh, that can then be studied in more robust data systems. So from a recombinant zoster vaccine licensure on October 20th, 2017 uh, to April 27th of 2018, there were 680 reports submitted to VAERS. No unusual patterns or unexpected uh, adverse events were observed. 48 or 7% of reports involved co-administration with another adult vaccine. In brief, uh, the majority of the reports were among female vaccinees. 95% were adjudicated as non-serious, and there were five reports involving a death. During the same time period of the five months following vaccine licensure, uh, the most commonly reported symptoms among the 680 reports received are listed here. Of these top 15 most common symptoms, 14 of them may well re represent the reactogenicity uh, that has been characterized in clinical trials. Herpes zoster itself would be expected in some portion of older adults as either a vaccine failure or before the vaccine has had uh, sufficient time to have the necessary immunologic effects to be protective. A second pillar of safety monitoring is the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. Established in 1990, the VSD is a collaboration between CDC and several integrated healthcare plans. Uh, there are data on over 10 million persons per year with links between vaccination records and health outcome data. Uh, as of May 31st of this year, over 37,000 total doses of recombinant zoster vaccine were administered at the six VSD sites that are participating in safety monitoring. And that included 35,431 first doses and 1,872 uh, second doses. The VSD rapid cycle analysis protocol is uh, under review at VSD sites, and the first data extraction is anticipated in early August of 2018, with a three-month lag, and thus will include doses administered up to April of 2018. The VSD monitoring for recombinant zoster vaccine includes high-priority short-term uh, RCA outcomes, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, anaphylaxis, and acute myocardial infarction, uh, lower-priority short-term outcomes, such as gout, local and systemic reactions, and then also longer-term outcomes, such as a potential immune-mediated disease. So this is an MMWR published in late May based on early reports to VAERS. Uh, it's a descriptive paper outlining early administration errors involving recombinant zoster vaccine. During the first four months following RZV um, monitoring, uh, VAERS received 155 reports, 13 of which documented an, an administration error, including um, some reports documenting more than one error. Most errors involved giving recombinant zoster vaccine by the subcutaneous route rather than by the intramuscular route. Other reports included administration of recombinant zoster vaccine instead of uh, varis the intended varicella vaccine, administration of recombinant zoster vaccine after incorrect frozen storage, and errors involving reconstitution of the vaccine. With regard to CDC communication regarding both administration errors and recombinant zoster vaccine reactogenicity, we have engaged providers with the MMWR uh, just shown, online CME, um, as well as Medscape expert commentary videos, healthcare provider web pages, uh, multiple webinars and conferences, as well as fact sheets. With regard to public outreach, uh, we've created the vaccine information sheet, web pages, and fact sheet. And these are some examples of the fact sheets created for healthcare providers available uh, on the CDC webpage. And now on to monitoring for recombinant zoster vaccine effectiveness. 
CDC and partners are exploring opportunities to study real-world vaccine effectiveness of recombinant zoster vaccine via large health systems as well as administrative claims data. Uh, the objectives of observational studies in these settings uh, are to evaluate vaccine effectiveness of both one and two doses of recombinant zoster vaccine among adults uh, 15 and older, among uh, prior zoster vaccine live recipients, as well as among immunocompromised persons. The next section will focus on zoster vaccine coverage and two-dose completion. There are a number of systems in which CDC will monitor the zoster vaccine program, including uh, Trends in Immunization Practice Systems, or TIPS, uh, which is an immunization information system. The National Health Interview Survey, or NHIS, as well as the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, another national survey uh, that gives estimates at the state level. And the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which, as just described, uh, contains electronic health records. All of these systems can provide information on herpes zoster vaccine coverage, uptake, uh, uh, and three can provide information on two-dose completion of recombinant zoster vaccine. With respect to vaccine supply, due to high levels of uh, demand for recombinant zoster vaccine, trade name Shingrix, GSK has implemented order limits and providers have, uh, have experienced shipping delays, which will continue throughout 2018. GSK indicates they have increased the number of doses available for the U.S. market in 2018. GSK plans to uh, release doses to all customer types on a consistent, predictable schedule. Sorry for the remainder of the year. Supply of recombinant zoster vaccine uh, is sufficient to support the vaccination of more patients in the US than were vaccinated against shingles last year. With regard to CDC clinical guidance on the use of herpes zoster vaccines, uh, recombinant zoster vaccine is the preferred shingles vaccine. Every effort should be made to ensure that two doses are administered within the recommended interval. If more than six months have elapsed since the first dose of recombinant zoster vaccine, administer the second when possible. Do not restart the vaccine series and do not substitute uh, zoster vaccine live for the second dose of recombinant zoster vaccine. Zoster Vaccine Live, trade name Zostavax, is, rec is a recommended shingles vaccine for immunocompetent adults 60 years and older. A decision to vaccinate with Zoster Vaccine Live may be made after an informed discussion between patient and healthcare provider, considering such factors as patient preference for Zoster Vaccine Live or a desire for immediate vaccination when recombinant Zoster Vaccine is unavailable. Persons who have received zoster vaccine live are, in fact, recommended to subsequently receive recombinant zoster vaccine. Age and time since receipt of zoster vaccine live uh, may be considered to determine when to vaccinate with recombinant zoster vaccine. Keep in mind that according to expert opinion, the minimal interval uh, should be eight weeks. So in summary, CDC safety monitoring will proceed primarily in VAERS and VSD. Assessment of effectiveness is being planned in the settings of large health systems and administrative claims data. Coverage and adherence will be monitored via information, uh, immunization information systems, surveys, and electronic health records. And in addition to the monitoring plans for the current recommendations, evidence of safety and effectiveness of herpes zoster vaccine in immunocompromised persons is currently being reviewed by the work group. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dooling. That was great. Um, questions, comments, Dr. Hunter? Um, it, you are looking to see the completion rate, the two-dose completion rate. Um, I, again, I think I missed when you expect to have some early results on that. So I can, uh, I'll turn that over to uh, my colleagues in immunization. Yeah, so we're hoping to use a variety of electronic health record data sources to look at two-dose completion rates. One of them is um, the vaccine safety data link, but there are also a couple of other sources. In terms of when we'll have our first estimates on two-dose completion, um, it'll probably be a year before we can give any good estimates of that. 
follow up on that. Um, will there be any way to know that the limited supply of vaccine had anything to do with the lack of completing the second dose? Uh, not really. I mean, we will be able to look at the time between the first dose and the second dose, but we won't be able to attribute that. I think it's going to be difficult in this first time period, the first um, six to 12 months, to really parse that out because of the, of the limited supply. So we probably won't really have a good sense of the two-dose completion rate until next year. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Lett. Um, Susan Lett, CSTE. I don't, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to really compliment the um, materials that CDC has put together to help with administration advice. And I really like the Shinrick's Know the Site um, job aid, and we've been distributing that a lot. So thank you. It's very helpful. It's nice to hear. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much, Dr. Dooling. Um, next, we're going to have public comment. Um, and Amanda, do you want to? Yeah. So we have several people who are signed up for uh, public comment. And um, if it's okay, I'll call you up um, in the order in which we uh, received your request. Um, I do want to just remind people to please say their full names and the organization from which they, if they represent an organization, um, so that we can record that in the minutes. Um, the first uh, person is uh, Dr. Paul Offit, and then it will be Rebecca Hastings, Tia Severino, Del Bigtree, Patricia Menschwander, Catherine Layton, and Jeffrey Jackson. Thank you. So we'll start with Dr. Offit. Thank you. So, so I was sent an email by Dr. Plot, and he wanted me to read this on behalf of him. <laughs> so this is Dr. Plotkin without the Brooklyn accent. <laughs> Quote, of course, a third dose of mumps vaccine should be given to stop outbreaks as recommended by the working group. However, that does not go far enough, as I have argued previously and recommended in an article just published in the Journal of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. A new mumps vaccine would be desirable, but what we can do now is to give thir a third dose to those likely to be exposed to mumps in colleges. Recently, that recommendation has been echoed in an article from Greg Poland at the Mayo Clinic. Recent papers documenting outbreaks in students in Scotland and Canada also concluded that the current circulating strain differs from the mumps vaccine strain and that a new vaccine should be considered, but also show that these outbreaks will continue unless third doses are routinely recommended in college populations, routinely as all capitals. Complications of mumps are occurring even in students who have received two doses of MMR, end quote. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raffick. Can I depend on you to read my notes next year? Yes, <laughs> count on me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rebecca Hastings, and I am a mom, a grandmother, and I've been a volunteer breastfeeding counselor, and I'm passionate about healthy babies. Um, thank you for this opportunity I grew up with awe and respect for the CDC since my dad worked here as a scientist his entire career. So it's an honor for me to address this committee and in light of this committee's mandate to reevaluate all recommendations as new scientific data emerges and with your known ability to evaluate complex issues and conflicting opinions and main up-to-date evidence-based decision making, I would like to highlight four recent areas of study demonstrate which demonstrate complex, nonspecific effects from the current recommended vaccine schedule. Firstly, Dr. Yao, who has a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, authored 33 peer-reviewed studies. He noted that the Hep B vaccine is administered to more than 70% of neonates worldwide, yet whether this impacts brain development is unknown. Dr. Yao and his team from China studied mice, and they published a paper in 2016 they showed how they injected them with hepatitis B vaccine, and they conclude this work reveals for the first time that early hep B vaccination induces impairments in behavior and hippocampal neurogenesis. This work provides innovative data supporting the long-suspected 
potential association of Hep B vaccine with certain neuropsychiatric disorders such as autism and multiple sclerosis. So in light of this evidence, it would seem prudent for the committee to consider a delay of the hepatitis B vaccine rather than recommend it on the first day of life. Secondly, I want to focus on SAFHR, small fragment homologous replacement, a technique being used in gene therapy studies. This same mechanism is suggested as inadvertently operative in vaccines manufactured using human fetal cell lines, which contain fetal and retroviral contaminants. In a 2014 published study by Dr. Teresa Deischer and her team, she showed that stem cells readily take up human DNA fragments into their own DNA sequence, causing mutations. There are clear and specific change points in the autism prevalence curve seen in multiple countries coinciding directly with human cell lines used in MMR2, varicella, and hepatitis A instead of the previously used animal mediums. And now that Pentacel also has these human cell lines, they were not able to look at that due to the time of their study. Thirdly, there is growing body of research on aluminum dangers. As the committee members should be well aware, the cumulative amount of aluminum in the current vaccine schedule is 4,925 micrograms in the first 18 months of life. That's not counting the preschool boosters or the later shots they get as teenagers or adults. Um, since aluminum has never been clinically approved or clinically demonstrated to be safe, the evidence-based study is urgently needed to look at the impact of this aluminum. And finally, Anthony Mawson from the University of Mississippi in 2017 um, published a vaccinated versus unvaccinated study. He did show that non-vaccinated children had a higher risk of chickenpox and whooping cough. However, surprisingly, he found that the vaccinated had more doctor's visits, more otitis media, more pneumonia, more allergies, more eczema, and more neurodevelopmental disorders. By far, the largest risk group that he found was preterm vaccinated babies had a 6.6-fold increased risk of neurodevelopmental disorders than preterms who did not receive vaccines. At the very least, this committee needs to urgently revise the vaccine recommendation for preterm babies. So um, do you have working groups investigating these complex, nonspecific effects from Hep B, human cell lines, aluminum, and preterm babies. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tia Severino, and I'm officially Luke's mom. Luke. And right here. This is my son, Luke. He's 11 years old. He has autism, and he, um, okay, so I'm going to read my little thing. Okay, you're going to stand right here with me and be a good boy, okay? Okay, so, run around. nobody, I need you to not run around. Run these, around. These, these folks are being very kind to allow me to speak. Okay, so um, it seems to me, based on what I've observed today and also uh, based on the um, online viewing of previous ACIP meetings that um, this panel is tasked with making very important decisions that affect a lot of people. And perhaps you're making those decisions without fully understanding how those decisions may affect some people, especially children. Um, from what I can ascertain, the, um, the data sets that you have to go on are epidemiological stu studies that do not look at a placebo-based control group and the passive reporting system known as VAERS. Um, my son is vaccine injured. He has autism. I also have two other members in the family that have vaccine injury, myself included. My last Tdap vaccine gave me severe nerve damage. Um, back in 2008, my son was one of the first participants in the study to explore early development. That is a CDC-sponsored study called the SEED study. My son participated in it. They followed him for about three years. They took extensive medical histories, evaluations, um, a complete vaccination record, stools, every... I know how extensive that data was, okay? 
sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Um, so this study was exhaustive. It looked at the uh, vaccination records of both autistic and neurotypical children, and I believe there was six locations where they looked at these at children. The study has been referred to by one of CDC's top scientists, Dr. William Thompson, as the mother load of data. A massive amount of data which, to date, has not been examined for clues to the relationship between autism and vaccines. I would like to encourage this panel to examine that data because the thousands of us mothers who watched our children regress after vaccines were simply not satisfied being told the science is settled, vaccines don't cause autism. We know what we saw happen to our kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Del Bigtree with the Informed Consent Action Network. I want to thank the members of ACIP for the incredible job you do, and I know it's a difficult job, and for those of you leaving us, I want to thank you for your time, and certainly Dr. Bennett, thank you for making this such an enjoyable experience. Um, I just want to address the idea of adding a third MMR vaccine, and in this case, uh, partially I do agree with Dr. Plotkin that uh, we should be looking at a better vaccine. And, I wonder why we don't hear that discussion more here instead of adding a vaccine that's clearly failing. And why is it failing? And where's the discussion on why are we seeing a failing of a vaccine? And I think that it's also important when you think about ASIP, again, how you're recognized by the public. We have an ongoing case now where you have two scientists, Dr. Kraling and Wachowski, that have come forward and said they were forced to lie and commit fraud on exactly that, the, the effectiveness of the mumps strain being used in the MMR vaccine. So while there's an ongoing case and we have work groups here working on it, it seems to me that it'd be very intelligent to think about waiting for that decision to be made. Imagine ASIP decides to add a third vaccine and then suddenly we find out that it is true that fraud was committed. I also don't think it's ironic that in 2010, when these scientists came forward, they predicted we would see exactly the problem we're seeing. So I don't think in normal circumstances, if you're going to let whistleblowers go without attention, maybe it's because there's no relevance. But we have real relevance here, given the case that's being looked at. And I would hate to see ASIP have you know, the look and the opinion of the public be diminished because you made a decision, and then a case showed that maybe perhaps should not have made that decision. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Hello, my name is Patricia Neuenschwander. Um, I've been a nurse for nearly 25 years, and I have witnessed an increase in neurodevelopmental disabilities and chronic disease in our children over those 25 years. The literature also reflects that this increase is happening. The vaccine schedule has rapidly increased from 12 doses in 1983 to 72 doses in 2017. We have gone from a 12% rate of chronic disease in our children to a rate of 54% in 2011. Although it feels really good to protect, to protect children by preventing infectious disease, what if it is at the cost of chronic disease? There have not been any placebo-controlled studies done um, as they're considered unethical for vaccines. There are no long-term safety studies that look at the schedule or the combination of vaccines that are given to children. And um, there's an urgent need for long-term, higher-quality studies that look at the long-term effects of neurological and immune system outcomes in children. Can this committee ask or demand from the CDC that they conduct a large study using the VSD to evaluate the health outcomes in children fully vaccinated compared to children who are completely unvaccinated to try to give us an idea if we may be trading infectious disease for chronic disease and is it worth that cost? I care very much about the health of children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Katherine Layton. I'm from the Informed Consent Action Network. Thank you all very much for allowing me to speak. I'd like to call to attention a newly published study in the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health 
entitled, A Lower Probability of Pregnancy in Females in the USA Ages 25 to 29 Who Received a Human Papillomavirus Vaccine Injection. It looked at data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. The study looked at 8 million married and unmarried women ages 25 to 29 between 2007 and 2014, their history of pregnancy and HPV vaccination status. It found that within both married and unmarried groups, women who were given HPV vaccine were 25% less likely to have been pregnant at least once. This is unmarried and married groups. It calls for further studies on the influence of HPV vaccine and fertility. It is known that the birth rates in the United States for women at age 30 are at record lows, according to the most recent NCHS data brief. Therefore, I urge the workgroup and ACIP to take these findings into consideration within their discussions when considering a recommendation for this vaccine in older age groups. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Jackson, and I have a couple um, points regarding the HPV vaccination or the HPV vaccine as well, uh, particularly the nine valent. Um, this is in regards to the ACIP's uh, working group on vaccination as well as the FDA's priority review on the vaccination. Um, a couple data points that I saw from slides um, to in today's presentation was um, the HPV vaccination will have its greatest impact when administered before onset of sexual activity. Over 90% of males and uh, females are sexually active by their mid-20s. Based on epidemiology, the population benefit of mid-adults would be low in comparisons to younger adults. So given those data points, I would um, urge both the work group and the FTA priority review to um, consider looking at all the data and um, taking that into account while expanding that into the greater population. And um, regarding the HPV vaccination, particularly the nine valent, um, there is a, uh, over a decade of a global consensus, or I shouldn't say consensus, but a global body of evidence that has been growing on the effects of injected, not ingested aluminum. And um, I would consider, uh, I would wish for the ACIP working group and for the FDA to both consider the um, global scientific body, uh, which is relevant for this vaccine, and not just the um, science that is done by, or not to over rely on the science that's done by the manufacturer of the vaccine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have one more um, request for public comment, Ms. Woodruff. Andrea Woodruff. Um, I'll be honest, um, there's a lot of uh, um, policies that this committee has made that I'm not very happy about. However, one thing I am very impressed about is your transparency. You have allowed everyone to come here and give their opinion. And I have been looking around the world, um, including watching the World Health Organization, and it is not as transparent as you are. Um, as you continue to work with the World Health Organization, um, I ask that you bring this value to them and open up their um, decision-making processes so we can see how things go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any further public comment? Okay. I think seeing none, we are adjourned. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you very much.